The Enemy by Charlie Higson, a super scary first chapter Friday reading with The Word Nerd. Today as you listen, watch for the story quote that will appear on screen. Write it down word by word and then follow the instructions given to you by your teacher. Before we dive into reading today, I'd like to let you know that most books on my First Chapter Friday playlist are for middle grade audiences, but today's book, along with a few others pictured here today, are more appropriate for mature readers in grades 8 and up. Hi, my name is Amanda Ziva. Welcome to my channel, Learning with the Word Nerd, in another First Chapter Friday video. This week, I'm going to be reading you the first two chapters of a book called The Enemy by Charlie Higson. And before I do that, I want to let you know that usually I hate to be scared. I don't like scary movies. I don't like roller coasters. I definitely don't like scary books uh, because I'm a very vivid dreamer and, and books more so than any other media just like get in my head and, um, and, and cause me to have nightmares. But all that being said, when I walked past this book and read the description, I was so hooked that I couldn't not read the story. Um, let me take you back a little bit. Uh, once upon a time, uh, my husband and I lived in a teeny tiny town of like 8,000 people and there were no bookstores for the most uh, time that we lived there. Um, and so if I wanted to buy a physical book, I, I wanted to pick it up and look at it, uh, I had to get them from Walmart. And so I was walking around Walmart one day and I saw the cover of this book and I read the back and it just hooked me and I had to read it even though I knew I would probably be scared. So um, that copy of the book that I bought went into my classroom library and somebody else loved it so much that they never brought it back. So I, I had to buy a new copy, uh, which, you know, buying books, not a bad thing in my opinion. Um, but the copy I have it uh, doesn't have the blurb on the back, so I'm going to read it to you from my phone, and then we will dive into this super scary story. Um, quick note, uh, on the Amazon listing, it does say grades 9 and up and ages 14 and up. Um, you are your best judge of what is a good fit for you, so know that guideline going in, um, but if you're younger than that and you love really scary things, um, you know, maybe talk to your teachers or parents and decide if this one's going to be okay for you, or maybe convince them to read it with you. Here's what it says. In the wake of a devastating disease, everyone 16 and older is either dead or a decomposing, brainless creature with a ravenous appetite for flesh. These teens have barricaded themselves throughout London and ventured outside only when they need to scavenge for food. The group of kids living in a weight row supermarket is beginning to run out of options. When a mysterious traveler arrives and offers them a safe haven at Buckingham Palace, they begin a harrowing journey across London. But their fight is far from over. The threat from within the palace is as real as the one outside. Full of unexpected twists and quick-thinking heroes, the enemy is a fast-paced, white-knuckle tale of survival in the face of unimaginable horror. So just imagine this. You're a kid. You're in London. A disease hits, something we all know right now. Um, and everyone 16 and older either dies or turns into a zombie. So that means that everybody else left in a normal state is 15 or un under. And you have to figure out how you're going to survive. And there's this group of kids who have decided that inside a supermarket with the locked gates and, you know, the, the, the chain things that come down um, with all the food is going to be the best place for them to be. But now they've been there for a while and they're running out of food and they don't know what to do. Somebody says, hey, come on over to Buckingham Palace. There's a bunch of kids who are safe there. And you think, wow, this huge palace, like safe, secure, lots of kids together. Um, would you go? Would you not go? All right, that's where our characters are when we first start this super scary story. So, uh, The Enemy by Charlie Higson, Chapter 1. Also, I love books with maps, social studies minor, uh, you know, that's, that's in there too, which is very cool. Small Sam was playing in the parking lot behind the Wait Rose supermarket when the grown-ups took him. He'd been with some of the little kids having a battle with an odd assortment of action figures when it happened. They weren't supposed to play outside without a guard, but it was a lovely sunny day and the little kids got bored indoors. Sam wasn't the youngest of the group, but he was the smallest. That's why they called him Small Sam. There had originally been two other Sams, Big Sam and Curly Sam, who had curly hair. Big Sam had been killed a few months ago, but Small Sam was still stuck with the name. It was probably because of his size that the grown-ups went for him. They were like that. They picked out the youngsters, the weaklings, the little ones. 
In the panic of the attack, the rest of Sam's gang got back safely inside, but Sam was cut off and roving Sam was cut off and the roving pack of grown-ups trapped him in a corner. They had come over the side wall, led by a big mother in a tracksuit that might have once been pink, but was now so filthy and greasy it looked like gray plastic. She had a fat, egg-like body on top of long, skinny legs. Her back was bent and she ran stooped over, but surprisingly fast. Her arms held wide like a scorpion's claw, her dirty blonde hair hanging straight down. Her face blank and stupid, breathing through her mouth. Small Sam was too scared even to scream or call for help, and the grown-ups made no noise, so the whole scene was played out in horrible silence. The mother blocked off the route back to the building while two lanky fathers ran at him from either side. Sam dodged them for a few seconds, but he knew they'd get a hold of him in the end. By the time help came from inside, the grown-ups had gone back over the wall with Sam stuffed inside a sack. Maxie led a group of bigger kids out into the parking lot. Even though they were armed with spears and clubs and good throwing rocks, they moved cautiously, not knowing exactly what to expect. We're too late, said Callum, scanning the empty parking lot. They've got him. Shame, said a stocky-haired kid called Josh. I liked him. He was funny. That's the second attack this week, said Maxie angrily. What's going on? Either the grown-ups are closing in on us, or they're getting braver. They ain't brave, said Josh, spitting on the ground. If they were still here, I'd have shown them brave. I'd mash their ugly faces. Nothing scares me. So why were they here, asked Maxie. They're just hungry, said Josh. We're all hungry, said Callum. We should have been here, said Maxie. We should have been watching over them. We can't be everywhere at once, Callum pointed out. There's not enough of us, not with Aaron out with the scabs. Our job's to keep a lookout from the roof. The little kids knew they weren't supposed to be out here. Nobody should be out here. We should all stay inside. We can't stay inside all day, scoffed Josh. We'd go crazy. It's good inside, said Callum. You're just scared to come outside, said Josh with a smirk. No, I ain't, said Callum. No more scared than you. Nothing scares me, said Josh. Then you're just stupid, said Callum. Nah, said Josh. The thing about grown-ups is some of them are strong. Some of them can run fast and some of them are clever. But the strong ones are slow, the fast ones are stupid, and the smart ones are weak. Tell that to small Sam, said Maxie angrily, and to Big Sam and Jono and Eve and Muhammad and all the other kids we've lost. Grown-ups won't get me said Josh. What? said Callum. So it was their fault they got taken? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I am, said Josh. Shut up, Maxie snapped at the two of them. Then she said this thing that nobody wanted to admit. We can't go on like this. Her voice was heavy with bitterness. Soon, we're all going to be dead. I can't stand it anymore. She threw down the spear she'd been carrying and sat on the ground, resting her head in her hands. It was her fault. That was all she could think. It was all her fault. When Aaron was away, she was supposed to be in charge. She couldn't, be, she couldn't remember when it had been decided. Aaron was the leader. She was second in command. It must have happened early on when most of the kids had been too frightened and confused to do anything for themselves. Aaron and Maxie had just gotten on with it, organizing everyone, keeping their spirits up. Aaron was clever and likable. Right from the start, he'd kept his head and not panicked. He'd been the captain of a soccer team at William Ellis School, and nothing ever seemed to freak him out. The two of them had worked together, a team. Maxie had always been good at getting other children to help out. There were better fighters than her, true, but they were happy for her to tell them what to do. They didn't want that responsibility. And when Aaron wasn't there, she was the leader. So it was all her fault. Another kid gone. She shut down part of her mind. She didn't want to think about what the grown-ups would do to small Sam. She started to cry, and she didn't care who saw it. Callum looked at Josh. They both felt awkward. In the end, it was Josh who squatted down next to her and put an arm around her shoulders. It's all right, Max, he said quietly. We'll be all right. Something will happen. Someone will come. Something's got to change. When Aaron and the others get back, we'll talk about it, maybe. Yeah? Make a plan? What's the point, said Maxie. When Aaron gets back, yeah? Maxie looked up into Josh's concerned, grubby face. Sorry, she said. Come on, said Callum. Let's try and find out how they got over the wall. Then we should get back inside. Yeah. Maxie jumped up. 
It was okay as long as you were doing something, as long as you didn't stop and think. She wished Aaron were here, though. She always felt safer when he was around. It was just... What was he going to think? Another kid. Gone. All her fault. Chapter 2 A burster was lying in the middle of the road. A father, by the looks of it, though, it was hard to tell. He had the familiar look of a vegetable or a piece of fruit left too long in the sun. The skin blackened, shriveled up and split, the overripe flesh squeezing inside out. His insides had turned to mush. This is what happened if any grown-up lived long enough to let the disease run its full course. They literally burst. Aaron prodded the body with a sneaker. As he did so, the skin popped and a stream of pus oozed out, followed by a bright pink blossom of soft fat. Aaron was leaving the scavenger party. Tall, fair-haired, and athletic, he had a knife in his belt and carried a pickaxe handle as a club. Gross, snickered a boy at his side, who had a shock of curly hair bleached almost white. Come on, we don't have time for this. Aaron turned his back on the corpse and continued up Holloway Road. When the first disaster happened, the kids had been appalled and fascinated by dead bodies. Now, they were all used to them. They hardly even noticed them. A burster, though, that was still a little special. The scavenger party took up their positions with Aaron and trudged on. They hadn't got another hundred yards, however, before the bleach-haired boy Deke slowed down. What's that? They stopped and listened. Dogs, said another boy, and he moved to the front. He was shorter than Aaron and not as strong. He had proved time and time again, though, that fighting was not all about strength. Aaron was the leader, but Achilles was the best fighter of them all, with wiry bill, dark eyes, and olive skin. He spent most of his spare time shaving elaborate patterns into his short hair. He could be moody and sarcastic and quick to lose his temper, but nobody much minded because he'd saved them all many times with his combat skills. He moved fast, used his brain, and was utterly ruthless in a fight. They waited. They could hear the dogs on before they saw them, a cacophony of howling, yelping, and barking all jumbled together. It sounded like a single mad beast. Achilles leveled his spear, pointing it toward the noise. It was made from a metal spike he'd found on a building site. It had a heavy lump at one end, and he'd sharpen the other into a vicious point. It was perfect for keeping grown-ups at bay. He could stab with the front and use the back end to batter them. It was definitely not for throwing, far too precious for that. Aaron took up a defensive position behind him, next to Freak and Deke. Freak and Deke were a team, best mates. Before the disaster, they'd taken the streets armed with only spray cans. Their tag was Freaky Deaky, and it could be seen all over Turnfell Park in Camden Town, sprayed on walls and shutters, stenciled onto the sidewalk, scratched onto the glass and the bus shelters. They knew all the back ways, all the alleys, all the shortcuts. Freak, whose real name was David, had close-cropped hair and a thin, pinched face. He was always sniffing. Deke was the bigger of the two. He was good-looking and would have been popular with the girls if he hadn't spent all his time with Freak. The two were inseparable, always finishing each other's sentences and laughing at each other's jokes. Freak carried an axe and Deke carried a sledgehammer. They were mainly for knocking down doors and opening windows, although, if needed, they could be used as weapons. The last in the group was Ollie, small and red-haired and the cleverest of them all. He had sharp eyes and could think quickly. He kept to himself, and most of the time he kept quiet, but when he did speak, people listened. Aaron would often ask Ollie for advice, and it was never seen as a weakness. Ollie always knew the best thing to do. As the barking of the dogs grew louder, Ollie stepped back into one side, keeping a clear line of sight. His weapon was a slingshot that he had taken from a sports shop. It was a powerful hunter's model with a pistol grip and a metal brace that fitted over his forearm. He drew the rubber band back and tucked a heavy steel ball into the worn leather pouch. Whenever the kids were outside of camp, they traveled in groups of at least four. One to look ahead and lead the way, two to check the sides, and one to watch their backs. But as Freak and Deke always worked together, there were five of them today. They had learned early on to move down the middle of the roads rather than to stay out of sight among the buildings along the sides. Grown-ups could hide in the shadows and grab you from the darkness. They weren't such a threat out in the open because, the whole, because on the whole they didn't move fast enough. The biggest danger was if you got surrounded. In a mass of grown-ups, in a mass, the grown-ups were a real threat, bigger and heavier than the kids and diseased. Grown-ups were rarely organized enough to plan any real strategy, though, and for the most part, they came lumbering out in a pack from the side. 
and then the best thing to do was run. Anything to avoid a fight. Dogs, however, were different. Unpredictable. Dangerous. Are they coming our way, said Freak, scratching his stubbly head? I think so, said Ollie, his slingshot creaking. Let them, said Achilles. I'm ready. It gets more dangerous every time we come out, said Aaron. Tell me about it, said Deke, twitching nervously, his sledgehammer in his hand. Then the first of the dogs appeared. A skinny mongrel with one eye. It bowled out onto the street, fell over, wriggled on the ground, and then lay on its back and surrender. A second dog was hard on its tail, a dirty pit bull. It had evidently been chasing the mongrel because it came at him with teeth bared and hackles raised. There was an almost comical moment when the two dogs realized that they had an audience. They both did a double take and looked at the boys in surprise. The rest of the pack came into view at almost the same time, howling and barking. They skidded to a halt and a couple of them knocked into the pit bull who turned and snapped at them. The little mongrel saw its moment and scurried off. The pit bull, though, it stood there, sniffing the air. The other dogs were a mismatched mob with missing fur and diseased eyes caked with pus. Some were limping, some wounded. One sat down on the road and vigorously scratched its ear until another dog bit it and it scampered away. The pit bull strutted forward, growling, and then it started to bark at the boys and the rest of the pack joined in. Instantly, the street was filled with their racket. Will they attack, do you think? asked Freak. Depends how hungry they are, said Aaron. They look pretty hungry to me, said Deke, and he gripped his sledgehammer tighter. Try and scare them off, said Aaron. And the boys now made a racket of their own, yelling and screaming and waving their arms. Some of the dogs backed off, but the bolder ones were soon inching closer. The big pit bull shook his head and nose to head, his claws scratching on the asphalt. Take him out, said Aaron. He's the boss. Maybe the others will get the message. Ollie loosed his shot. The steel ball hit the dog squarely in the forehead, and his legs crumpled, and he went down without a sound. The other dog sniffed him, and one or two set up howling. Then a big German shepherd ran from the back of the pack, leading other three, three other hounds with him. Achilles went down on one knee, and as the dog pounced, he stuck him through the chest with his spear. The followers veered off to the side, and Ollie hit one more with the steel ball breaking its leg. It yelped and turned tail, dragging its leg behind. With a great war cry, the boys charged and the rest of the dogs scattered. Ollie quickly searched the area for his ammunition. He found a second ball lying in the gutter. The first one was stuck in the pit bull's head in a neat crease of broken bone. The five of them knelt by the dead body. Can we risk eating it? asked Freak. What's that parasite Maeve's always going on about? That worm thing you can catch from eating dog? Tricky something? Trichdenosis, said Aaron. He'll be all right if he's well cooked. Yeah, said Deke. We'll deep fry him in batter with some fries and a nice glass of wine. Delicious. Freak giggled. I know a gourmet recipe for fried dog. We can't waste any food, said Aaron. Some of the kids are getting really thin. Leave the German shepherd, though. He's too big to carry, and his carcass might keep the pack busy. Achilles took out his knife and gutted the dead animal, leaving the purple-gray entrails on the road to further distract the other dogs. He then tied the dog's legs together with some nylon cord and slung it over Aaron's shoulder. Should we go back? asked Freak. We need to find as much food as we can, said Aaron. It's always a risk leaving camp and it's getting riskier every time. The dog's not enough for 20 of us. Every day a scavenging party left the camp to look for supplies. They searched among the empty houses and apartments for any abandoned cans, packages, and bottles. Each time they had to search their farm each time they had to start their search farther from White Rose. All the buildings close by had long since been picked clean. Most days they found nothing, but a lucky discovery could last them a long time. They knew it couldn't last, though. They had already been through every accessible building within a mile of White Rose, except Crouch End, which had been destroyed in a fire, and up around the Arsenal Soccer Stadium, where there was a large nest of grown-ups. Sooner or later, they would have to move camp. But where would they go? Aaron pushed his hair out of his eyes. His guts hurt. He didn't really feel hungry anymore, just sick and tired. He'd grown to hate these streets. The smell of them, the filth everywhere, the grass and weeds pushing out of cracks, the constant fear chewing away at him. He had been happy at first when they'd made him a leader, but it was slowly dawning on him that he was responsible for everyone else. If anything went wrong, he had to take the blame. That was why someone like Achilles, who could easily beat him in a fight, was happy not to be in charge. He could show off and suck up some of the praise, but when a tough decision had to be made, he would sit back and 
hold up his hands and let Aaron sweat it out. It was a warm and sunny spring day. There was a real sense that summer wasn't far off. Normally Aaron would have enjoyed the sunshine and warmth. In the past, he had always loved seeing the first green leaves come out on the trees as if the world were finally waking up again. Now it just meant that the grown-ups were getting bolder. In the winter, they'd been too cold and feeble to be much danger, but the change in the weather seemed to give them new courage and strength. Their attacks were becoming more frequent. They were hungrier than ever. The kids trudged up Holloway Road. It was full of memories for Aaron, eating McDonald's, shopping with his mom, going to the movies. He tried to shut the memories out. They only made him feel worse. When they came to the archway, they moved more cautiously. There was a tube station here, a perfect hiding place for grown-ups. Which way, said Deke. Highgate Road, said Aaron, we'll work our way toward the Whittington. Ain't going to no hospital, said Achilles. What's the problem? There won't be nothing in there, said Achilles. Maybe drugs, said Ollie. Paracetamol, paracetamol and antibiotics and that? Doubt it, said Deke. When everything kicked off, it would have been the first place to be looted. We'll take a look anyway, said Aaron, just in case, but let's try the houses around here first. I ain't going in no hospital, Achilles repeated. What about the swimming pool then, said Freak. What about it, said Achilles. Worth a look, eh? Why, said Achilles, do you feel like taking a swim? Nah, said Freak, but there was always a vending machine in there. Never worked, said Achilles, always stole your money. Worth a look, said Freak, think about it. Mars bars, chips, chewing gum. Won't be nothing in there, said Achilles, not after all this time. Listen, Freak insisted, far as we know, us and the Morrison's crew are the only kids around here, and they never come up here. All I'm saying is we should look, okay? If we're looking in the Whittington, we should look in the pool as well. We search everywhere. Isn't that right, Aaron? Suppose so, said Aaron. Waste of time, said Ollie. When have we ever found a vending machine with anything in it? You agree with me, don't you, Deke, said Freak. He agrees with everything you say, Achilles scoffed. Try me, said Deke. The world is flat, said Freak. Yes, it is, said Deke. Penguins can fly, said Freak. Yes, they can, said Deke. I am the greatest kid that ever walked the earth, said Freak. Yes, you are, said Deke. Ha, ha, very funny, said Achilles. Aki is a jerk, said Freak. Yes, he is, said Deke. I think you've made your point, said Aaron, trying not to smile. We'll take a look. Ollie sighed. This was a waste of time. What they needed was proper food, not junk. But Aaron had spoken, and he was their leader. Ollie shoved a hand into his jacket and rolled the heavy steel shot between his fingers. The cold hardness comforted him. He didn't like the idea of exploring the swimming pool. He was always scared in these hunts, and going into the unknown like this just made his heart race faster. Come on, said Aaron. Let's go. Searching the swimming pool is a genius idea, said Freak. Yes, it is, said Deke. If you want to know what happens to Aaron and Max and Small Sam and all of the other kids in this amazingly scary tale, The Enemy, uh, you can get a copy from your local library, um, school library, indie bookstore, or if you can't uh, find any of those and you're like me and live in a small town without a bookstore, uh, you can check the link in the description box below. A uh, couple other things. Uh, this book is the first in a series of seven, so if you're someone who loves series because then there's something next waiting for you, this is a good one. And also this author, Charlie Higson, um, this isn't even his most popular series. His most popular series is called the Young James Bond series. The first book is called Silverfin, um, and there are eight books in that one, and I will link it below. Um, I hope you enjoyed this tale. You're having a great month of spooky stories in October for Halloween and that you come back again for another first chapter Friday video. Happy reading. To continue reading The Enemy by Charlie Higson, check out a copy from your school library or purchase it from your local indie bookstore or grab it via the link in the description box below. Today's mystery quote says, if you made it to the end of the day, then it was a good day. You didn't think any further ahead than that. The future was a mystery. Make sure you check out the rest of the First Chapter Friday playlist. I have tons of great middle grade and YA stories waiting for you, one for each week of the year. Please like this video and subscribe so you can stay connected for more great First Chapter Friday videos and other videos you can use in your classroom. Happy reading!